Thank you. Sorry about the chair. Um, one hint, never believe an orthopaedic surgeon when they tell you how long it takes to heal your broken bones. <laughs> I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking to you about healthcare provider funder models. And you'll be thinking, how could they possibly put something so boring on at this time? At least after lunch you could go to sleep. Um, but I would like to promise you that at the end of this, it'll leave you something that you'll remember next time you have a decision to take about your health care. This is uh, transplantation. I want to tell you about uh, transplantation. And uh, I first met my first transplant patient in 1978 in a hospital called Guy's. Um, he was a young man, um, younger than me by definition, uh, about 25 I think at the time, and I was a resident and it was the night watch. So it was the night watch because the rhythm of organ donation works like this. Diagnosis of brain death in an intensive care unit occurs in the morning. And then the families think about what their loved one would have wanted during the day. And then we get the call about organ donation in the early evening. And then retrieval of the organs followed by uh, the uh, matching with the recipient. And so the young resident gets a call in the middle of the night to get up and meet uh, a young man, brave young man, who's heading for transplant. This is 1978. Uh, and I have about 15 minutes to have a chat to him. I talk to our legendary transplant surgeon, Mick, um, who tells me that he'll be in the operating theatre in 15 minutes and that the patient had better be there too or my future career and happiness will be in jeopardy. I get about three hours sleep and I get the same call from Mick that the patient will be back in the ward in about 15 minutes and my future career and happiness will depend on me being there. At that time he had about a 20% uh, chance of dying over the next year and a 50% chance that his kidney would be working. Have you worked out the logo of the Transplantation Society? It's a Rodin um, sculpture, the cathedral. It's two right hands. It took me years to work that out. <laughs> two right hands. Transplantation takes two people. So in Australia today, that same man would have about a 2.5% chance of losing his life and about a 5% chance of losing his kidney over the next year. And this shows you the long-term results that we have. But it's a really expensive business. This is the United States data. But in this country, you'd spend about $60,000 every year on dialysis, or at least $60,000 for a transplant, and then a little bit less than that each year. Americans are spending $30 billion a year from their healthcare government funds to pay for this. It's about 60,000 per person. There's about 500,000 people. Um, how did that start? It started on the floor of the Ways and Means Committee where a guy came and set up his dialysis and did dialysis in front of them, and they went, whoa, that's really expensive, that's really difficult. The individual can't bear that cost. Let's pay for it, $30 billion. Consumes 6% of the uh, US healthcare budget and um, uh, seven times more than the average American will get. So how do we share such expensive costs? Uh, basically two ways. There's taxation and uh, government payment. That's a community sharing the cost of the catastrophic healthcare Problem. And then there's insurance, just like you insure your car. Everybody pays for the insurance and only a few have crashes. So if we look and see who pays for healthcare, this is some data from the WHO. Um, nine, Australia pays 9.4% of its GDP. That's 9.4% of everything we own, everything we create, everything we make, everything we do, we put 9% into health. You've got to eat, you've got to have houses, you've got to have defence, you've got to pay for Canberra uh, with the rest. That's 4,000 international dollars um, per person. And government taxation pays for 66% and our personal insurance and personal pocket pay for 30%. And as a result, we live 82.5 years on average. In the USA, 17% of the GDP, $9,000 per average, it's the most of any country, 47% government, a bit more, 53% from the personal pocket. Philippines, 287 bucks. Pakistan, 126 bucks. 
So that's who pays for healthcare, who provides it. This is a picture of Westmead Hospital, Adult Hospital and Westmead Children's Hospital, biggest healthcare complex uh, in this country. And just down to the right off picture is our private hospital. We use public and private hospitals and we're familiar with them. There's one just over the back here. In Singapore, there's a little office in the, in the Singapore Power Building called IHH. And it owns and operates hospitals, private for-profit hospitals across swathes of Asia. Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, um, India, for-profit. So you have a couple of models, and I'll bring you back to the third model towards the end. So let's come back to organ and tissue donation and transplantation. Who runs it? No patient pays a single dollar from their own pocket. It's all through government taxation. It's all managed through the hospital, uh, through the uh, uh, government organisations and the public hospitals. The Australian Government Organ and Tissue Authority manages the organ donation program and we can allocate kidneys all the way across Australia based on uh, a medical algorithm that is blind to gender, wealth, power, political influence. Just to demonstrate it, that shows you the rate at which people get transplanted depending upon the quartiles of their socio-economic advantage. The computer doesn't care how much you earn. What happens when you change the model and you're using for-profit providers? For-profit incentivised doctors with a series of people in the middle to make the money. Jacob, can you lend me a hand? Actually, I don't want you to lend me a hand. I want you to give me a hand. Well, actually, I don't want you to give me a hand. I want you to sell me a hand because you can't have it back once I've chopped it off about here and taken it off and sewn it on somebody else. Um, you're going to be paid a little bit of money for it. What would you, what would you take for it? 10000 100000 Million? Ten million? Hundred million? Where are you going to lose your right hand? Actually, it's not a hand I want, it's a liver or a kidney. Um, this is an index which is used by the World Health Organization to see how unequal countries are. 5.8, that's Australia. Greenspan famously said to uh, John Howard, gee, you have the biggest middle class in the world. We're very equal. United States, five times less equal, 17.4. Philippines, 18.1. Pakistan, 30.1. There's very poor people and there's very, very, very rich people. If we look across the world, we have countries that have a very high human development index. Australia and Norway compete to be number one. Iceland used to be there before the global financial crisis. And then you see at the bottom end those who are, are very poor, and they use it to allocate charitable uh, aid. And you can see here that we've got an interesting phenomenon. Down here, we've got rich countries which don't do enough transplants. Unmet need. And down here, we've got countries that do transplants, have lots and lots of poor people. Opportunity. So let's talk about human trafficking. I want to tell you a few stories. They're all true. They're slightly disguised, but they're all true. This um, is a story about a man from a wealthy Middle East country who flew into uh, Manila Airport. At the airport, he got married to a nice Filipino woman. And they were then taken to the private hospital where they had a transplant. The wife donated to the husband. They both stayed in hospital three or four days. And he then divorced her on the way out of the country. And that was to evade a little thing about foreigners not being able to have kidneys given to them by Filipinos without uh, being married to them. And there was a doctor who set up a charitable clinic in a very poor village, a little bit outside Lahore in Pakistan. Everybody could come to him and be treated for all the minor ailments. They had a little cart, they had a cold, they had a cough, they had a bit of pneumonia. But when they needed a big operation, you need your gallbladder, right? You need a big operation to take your cancer out of your bowel. 
Ah, uh, sorry, I can't provide those facilities. But I do know a hospital that would do it for you, if providing you'd be prepared to give them an, a, a kidney while you're there, you can have the operation. Nasty scam. Uh, eventually picked up and uh, prosecuted uh, and in jail. Publicised by Dawn. There was a man in India, in Delhi. Um, he was a theatre operator, uh, orderly. Brings the trolleys in and out. And he decided he'd seen enough transplants to do one himself. <laughs> so he set up a little house. It had a drive-in garage so that you could be brought in in the covered van, bundled out of the covered van, put into, the, uh, into a room with a nurse. You'd go to sleep in the room, you'd have your transplant, you'd wake up in the room, the donor would have the same experience, the vendor would have the same experience, and you'd be driven out again. 500 people had that procedure before he was arrested. Now let's turn to China, the old China. It's in the news at the moment, you may have seen. It's almost always in the news. I don't know if this picture is actually staged or real. But in China, they developed a market for the sale of organs from the executed prisoners. And they managed to use the market forces. They got up to about 10,000 transplants a year, we think, at the peak. So a, a Saudi man, very sick, needing a liver transplant, flew to the hospital hotel with Saudi interpretation, with all the uh, requirements that they had waiting for his transplant. No transplant today. Where's my transplant? No transplant tomorrow. Where's my transplant? He'd arranged $500,000 as the all-inclusive fee for the transplant. Eventually, he negotiated a priority fee for the next transplant. One million dollars. Cash. He got the transplant the following day. I'm glad to say China's changed because it, as of January the 1st this year, it's not legal to use executed prisoners' organs. And I think they mean it. Um, I've been there a couple of times since then and they're really focusing on the alternatives for organ donation. They can't become a civilised country in the world while they continue uh, that process and the new leadership recognises that. But it's all in the funder-provider model. What you've got in those examples is very wealthy people who have not a clue what they're buying but think they need a transplant, told they need a transplant, and very poor people who are jeopardised by it. In private, for-profit hospitals with doctors incentivised per transplant and dehumanised by the processes they've got into. This is a charitable hospital. It's the second largest hospital, second largest transplant program in the world. It's based in Karachi. Does 550 transplants each year for free, charitable funding. The third provider model, charitable funding. So it's in the healthcare funder provider model that we lead to these extraordinary outcomes. So what we have is the private for profit process delivering appalling outcomes for outrageous prices in dehumanised environments. Can you see the devil? Can you see the angel? Can you see them both together? Because when you look at healthcare, you must look at it like this. This is uh, Escher, uh, German uh, artist, who famously, famously told Mick Jagger to get lost. Um, Beautiful illustration of transplantation, but also a beautiful illustration of healthcare. So my point to you is to consider next time that you are seeking healthcare or your family is seeking healthcare, are you on a black square or are you on a white square? Buy up aware healthcare is not a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you.